Hello there, First Church. Thank you so much for joining us from all of your respective locations. I want to welcome you. And uh, that was a tour of our house. We're in this relationship series talking about how to relationship while social distancing and how to make a house a home. And uh, that's our desire in this series. I just want to share a few wins with you really quickly. This last weekend, we had our Easter services, and we had record shares and reach online because of you guys. And I think more significantly, we had this text, I'm in, to 474747 if you wanted to go all in with Jesus. And I think we had like six people choose to follow Jesus as their leader and forgiver in one one-on-one conversations over the phone. And that, to me, is a huge win. Several of them said it was because they were scrolling through their news feed and you guys were sharing this service. And uh, because you shared, people's eternities were changed. God used that. So I want to celebrate that. I want to thank you for continuing to do that. I also want to say thank you for loving this community so well. We're continuing to distribute food to families in needs. This church is stepping up in so many ways, working um, behind the scenes to provide shelter for families, to do so much great stuff. And I'm just so proud of what this church is doing. We're not just sitting back serving ourselves in the midst of this crisis. You guys are doing great stuff. And uh, so much of that too is because of your generosity here. And I want to thank you again. It was so cool that we were able to hit our budgeted goal this week for the first time during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think I had a lot of fear when all of this first started. But we're growing and we're reaching. People are choosing to follow Jesus. Life groups are meeting via Zoom, and uh, that's so cool. And uh, we had our drive-in service on Easter Sunday, which was so much better than I expected. I brought in some pictures of it for you guys. This microphone is just ridiculous. But um, nevertheless, that's what we had to do to eliminate the wind sound. Um, but uh, it was moving to me. It was so much better than I thought it would be. Emotionally, I think all of us were touched by seeing one another, even if it was just through car windows. And a lot of you have asked me, are we going to do that again? And uh, the answer is yes, probably on Mother's Day. Stay tuned for um, more details to be announced, but uh, super moving. And uh, that brings me to the title of the series. As I already mentioned, it's How to Relationship While Social Distancing. And I know for the last month, I've been doing a lot of expository verse-by-verse messages. And if you don't know what that is, that's just where you preach through a specific passage of the Bible verse-by-verse. And I like doing it because it's the easiest way to preach. It's the funnest way for me personally. I like it best. But it's also not the way that Jesus preached. Jesus and the disciples always preached topical life messages rooted in biblical truths. And I want to follow that biblical example sometimes as well. And I also think for the church, expository verse-by-verse messages have become like an idol. Um, it's something that we do to be superior over other people, and I don't want that to be us. I don't want us to be a church that says, well, we do it this way, and that's the right way. There's lots of different ways you can communicate um, the Word of God, and if people far from God are filled with life in Christ, that's something we're going to celebrate no matter what. Now, um, we've been doing these workouts on DVD. If you don't know what a DVD player is, you can ask your parents, Um, but we've been doing these workouts. The one we've been doing is P90X3, which is sort of a beginner's workout for people who want to get back into working out. It's like baby P90X, and at first, for me, it was really hard, but it's gotten a lot better, so uh, now we upped our game to something called Beach body insanity. And uh, that's a good workout. And the thing I like about it is at the start, it shows before, after pictures. Kind of motivate you. It shows someone who's a little flabby, a little soggy. And then at the end, it shows you someone who's like, whoa, totally yoked because of, you know, um, P90X insanity or whatever it is. And uh, I love those before, after pics. But I keep reminding myself it's because they've been faithful for months. And the same is true for our faith. Don't do this once and expect a huge change in your life. I think experiencing spiritual growth in your life, the benefits happen over a long period of time. My wife is a woman who inspires so many people. Some of you have met Kristen, some of you haven't. But she's this radiant, amazing, glowing person. You can't talk to her and not feel and see God's presence in her. But I want to remind everybody, when you look at Kristen, you're seeing her after pick her spiritual afterpick. She became a Christian in a day, but her spiritual growth has happened over the last decade. And I just want to remind you, so many people are like, oh, I wish I could be like her. I wish, and you can't, but it takes a decade of faithfulness. It takes time and growth and intentionality and faithfulness. Join me online for this experience, how to relationship while social distancing for the next four weeks. And I really believe you're going to begin to see some differences in your life. And uh, this is not just about romantic relationships. It will be applicable to that, but I'm also going to talk about every kind of relationship here. And each week, we're going to look at an aspect of relationships while social distancing, but also in general. And uh, this week, I want to speak specifically about removing barriers to intimacy. If you want deep, deep, rich, connected relationships, listen up to what I'm going to teach today. Do you remember when you were first dating? Do you remember when you first had a brand new friendship with somebody and there was this uninhibited, loving interaction that was just so great and amazing and you could say anything and share anything and it was deep and you couldn't wait to see them? It's amazing how that fades over the course of time. 
And today I want us to talk specifically about why that happens. And I also want to teach you how to remove those barriers so that you can experience that. Again, if that's something that you desire, even if you're not a Christian, you're going to want to listen today because I really believe you're going to benefit from what I'm teaching to you. Now, growing up in Minnesota, everybody had a dog. It's kind of a thing in Minnesota. People had dogs and guns and fishing poles, right? And uh, these were the days back before people cared about what their dogs did. You could just let your dog run free and poop and pee and bite anyone you wanted. You just let him do that. Um, now, my neighbors, they were the best neighbors ever, but they had the worst dog ever. I hated their dog. His name was Speck. He was an old, mean, golden retriever. Speck was short for spectacular. And uh, he smelled bad. He smelled so bad. If you touched him, you'd have to, like, wash your hands, take a shower. He was a stinky dog. He bit... Um, But the worst part about Speck was that he would always poop right outside our door and in our backyard all the time. That's where Speck pooed. And uh, I hated it because I'd open up the door to go to school, and I'd step out immediately into a huge pile of Speck poop. And it was always like, ah, you know, and I didn't want to miss the bus, so I'd go to school with dog poop on my shoes, and people would be like, ew, John, you smell. And I'd be like, it's the dog. And they'd be like, oh, that's a silly excuse. You pooed yourself. No, I didn't, right? I swear. But anyway, the worst for me wasn't that. It was mowing the lawn. Because when I would mow the lawn, I would constantly be stressed about Speck's landmines all over our yard. And I'd be looking, and I'd be looking, and I'd see one just a few rows down. And I'd be like, don't hit that, right? Remember it in your mind. And I'd try to remember all the different locations. But inevitably, I would miss one, and all of a sudden, I'd see it going around and around on the wheels on the lawnmower. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You know, you're mowing the lawn, you see the poo going around the wheel. You're like, ah! Or you'd smell it, and you'd be like, where is it, where is it? And you'd look on your shoe. Ah, it's on my shoe. No, terrible, right? And uh, the thing that really got to me was the stress. I mean, mowing the lawn isn't that bad of a chore. It's okay, right? I mean, it's fun to be outside. It's okay to be exercising. The bad part is the worry and the stress of stepping in the wrong area. I was constantly on the lookout for for dog poop. And everywhere I went, I just, I couldn't enjoy it. I had fear and anxiety of finding this. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If I would have just taken a moment once a week before I mowed the lawn to walk through the yard and pick it all up, it would have been a stress-free experience for me. I mean... I could use the inside-out plastic bag strategy. All of us have done that. It's no big deal. I'm doing a little bit of pain and awkwardness now to avoid a lot of pain, stress, and anxiety later. Rather than enduring a few moments that were a little unpleasant by dealing with the problem in a respectable and wise manner, I simply chose to ignore it, step around it, and feel anxious the whole time. The thing is, if you want a relationship with a dog, you got to deal with the poo. You could deal with it by stepping around it and ignoring it, which ultimately leaves a lot of the yard unpleasant to go into and sometimes results in catastrophes on your shoes and lawnmower wheels. Or you could spend 10 minutes dealing with it. I think this is a perfect allegory for our relationships with people. I would say that America in particular has gotten pretty rough at dealing with landmines relationally in a healthy manner. It robs us of intimacy, and it leaves our relationships stunted. And today I want to show you a way to deal with it. Because right now, more than ever, we're literally and proverbially trapped in our yards. We're stuck here. Some of us are tiptoeing around, constantly stressed about not stepping in the wrong area. There are all these barriers to intimacy. We're anxious at home because we don't want to go in a no-go zone. This is a no-win scenario. Because best case scenario, you're stressed. Worst case scenario, you get messy. Life doesn't need to be this way. What I want to do is I want to unfold and unpack a biblical process to help address this. For a small amount of stress up front, you'll be able to remove the barriers that exist between you and deeper relationships and better connections so that you can enjoy your time together rather than being worried about stepping in the wrong area. Examples of conversations I want to teach you how to have today are um, things like ending a relationship, asking a friend to repay a loan, giving your boss feedback about their behavior, addressing custody or visitation issues with a co-parent. I want to teach you how to deal with a rebellious or troubled teen. I know some of you guys, finally, you've got your kid at home all the time, and they're a teenager, and you're like, oh my goodness, what have we done? This kid is out of control. I want to teach you to confront a loved one about substance abuse issues, and that's definitely something that's probably coming to the surface during this time right now. We're at home. We're beginning to realize, wow, this isn't just a something that's casual. This is a dependency. Dealing with unforgiveness or relational shutdown, asking in-laws to quit interfering. Some of you are like, that's not a problem anymore, Pastor, because they can't come because they're high risk. It's like, oh, you can't come over tonight? Shoot. Well, (laughs) I'll see you in whenever this is over, right? But anyway, um, terminating an employee, talking to a neighbor about property lines, or discussing problems concerning sexual intimacy. Speaking of that, I keep thinking, how many babies are we going to have in the nurseries five or nine months from now? A lot. Answer, a lot. But I think so many of us are trapped in yards full of relational landmines. And normally, we just cope by not spending a lot of time in the yard. We go fishing. 
We work long hours. We spend time with the girls. We spend time with the boys. We go out to eat. We do anything we can do to avoid going into a relational yard. Anything we can do to avoid real conversation. Sometimes when the yard gets really full, I know a lot of people who just have a tendency to go get a new yard. You ever know those serial people who every four or five years or ten years, they just move to a new place. They get divorced. They marry a new person. They move to a new city. They get a new job. I meet these people in my life, and they're so captivating. They're so fun to meet. But then you start to hear about their history, and it's like, oh, you can't deal with conflict. So you just move to a new place every ten years. Right now, even those extreme measures are harder because we're confined. We're in quarantine. And it makes the density of the landmines within our relational yards much more apparent. For many of us, no matter how we cope, we still do not experience the intimacy that we could if we could just deal with these issues in a healthy manner. And I think for so many of us, when it comes to confronting hard things, um, we deal with it in one of two ways. The first way that we deal with it is silence. Silence! So many of us just ignore the problem. If there's an issue, we just run away. We do everything we can to avoid talking with the person that we're in relationship with, right? We avoid through screen time, like that, that show Tiger King. So many of you have been talking to me about it. I was talking with someone about it. They're like, yeah, Tiger King this, Tiger And I was like, oh, should I watch it? And they were like, oh, no, Pastor. No, I hate that show. Don't watch it. So I haven't seen it, but whatever. You guys all talk about it. Um, but we just try to avoid being in relationship by sitting side by side rather than talking face to face. We shut down and we refuse to go there. If we're silent, we never have to go into the yard. The problem is we lose intimacy and connection. I know so many marriages where this is the main default. It's silence. We just don't go there. And the more time that goes on, the more there is that you can't talk about. And the more the yard fills up with these landmines. So basically, we just don't go in the yard anymore. It's like, yeah. Do you remember when we used to be in love? When we used to like each other? When we used to have a friendship? Now we're just basically business partners. I don't even know what we're doing. We're just, we have a meal-making co-op. That's kind of what we do together. That's our whole life. (laughs) Some of you are like, yep. Yeah, that's, uh, that's us, <laughs> right? Um, the other way that we cope is through violence. Silence or violence. And this method of coping is no good either. Usually we just jump straight from silence into an explosion of relational violence. I'm not talking about hitting here. I'm talking about relational violence. You know what I'm talking about. The, the yelling, the blaming, the angry tones, the eye rolling the saying cruel things, the crying, that's definitely a form of relational violence in some context, the mean body language. Instead of ignoring the landmines, we rage at them, and we all get messy, and the stuff literally hits the fan. Proverbs eleven seventeen says, your kindness will reward you, but your cruelty will destroy you. The Bible actually lays out a really great plan that is better than the process I just showed you, better than silence or violence, and I want to talk about it today. The biblical process for dealing with conflict and hard conversations and removing barriers to intimacy is actually laid out throughout the Bible. And throughout the newest part of the Bible, Jesus lays his foundation for confrontation. And uh, Paul actually calls us to be just like Jesus in this regard. Ephesians 4.15, Paul says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, just like Jesus, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. The key here that he's laying out, is when you want to deal with serious barriers to intimacy, you need to speak the truth in love. And I love how the text puts it. Which is more important, speaking the truth or speaking in love? People argue about this all the time, but the text seems to imply that it's both truth and love. It implies that the truth is a subject, but it's encased and packaged in love. If you don't put it in love, it's not going to work. You've got to have truth and love together. This is such a tough balance. I know people who are really great at truth. This might come as a big surprise to you, but I have a tendency to focus more on the truth than I do on love. If somebody screws up, I say, hey, I can't believe how terribly that went. I'm disappointed in your lack of foresight, and I'll just let them have it, right? But it's not just truth. You need to have love. Conversely, I have a friend who is also a millennial and a parent, and uh, man, it's funny to me how much love this guy has for his kids, but how little truth he has. The other day, I was watching him discipline his son And uh, we'll just change the names around. But he goes, "Um, Billy, you're three. Do you feel like playing with fire is a good choice? And what is with with millennial parents and choices? I want you to think about what you're choosing and your choices right now, right? Billy, do you think playing with fire is a good choice? And he's like, oh, you do? Really? Hey, Billy, I love you. Are you sure that playing with fire is a good choice? But I love you. Are you sure? It's like, stop. Stop with I love you. Your son is about to immolate right now. Like, what are you doing? Like, you need to give some truth for the love to save his life. Like, what are you doing? It's truth and love. Jesus talks with both all the time. This is how he lived life. You got to have truth and love together. And this verse talks about both right here. 
There's a tightrope that exists between silence and violence. I think it's truth and love. I think so many of us operate without this, right? We just jump from silence to violence. But Jesus teaches us that you have to have a balance, a connection in between. And it's a tightrope. It's a tightrope that takes discipline and art form and skill to apply. I think the hard thing is um, for us, it's really easy to want to go here or here. It's hard to stay in between these two, and that's why it's a discipline. For me, being silent and shutting down or getting angry is like a really nice Krispy Kreme donut. You know when they have that sign on that says hot and ready, and you're like, oh, I want to go there, and I want to eat it, and I'm hungry, right? That's what getting angry feels like to me. That's what road rage feels like to me. It's like, ooh, it's going to feel so good to give into my emotions. You know, for some of you, it's like, it's going to feel so good to cry and throw a temper tantrum right now and blame everything on other people. Like, it's going to feel so good. I just want to eat this donut. It's like, don't, don't. It's not good. It's not good for you, right? It's also an art. It's nuanced. It takes skill that must be learned and developed. It's hard, but it's worth it. And almost all of his confrontations, Jesus balanced really well with truth and love. There's a story in John chapter 8 of this woman getting caught in the literal act of, of adultery. And um, all these guys drag her to Jesus, and they're condemning her, and they're yelling at her. Jesus says some stuff and convicts them all, and they all leave. And he looks at this woman. He says, did any of them condemn you? And she says, no, Lord, none of them condemn me. Then Jesus replied, neither do I, but go and sin no more. Okay? It's love. I don't condemn you, but you got to stop, girl. You got to stop this, right? It's both. It's truth and love. This is how Jesus did it all the time. It's a tightrope, but it's real. Now, I'm sure some of you are like, okay, use truth and love, John. We get it. That's nice. But, like, really, give me something practical. How do I do that? Jesus sets the broad example. But then, through the rest of the Bible, every single book after the book of Acts in the New Testament, every single one of them lays out this incredible process. They're all letters to churches or young pastors. Um, there are people that they love whom they confront really well with difficult conversations to remove barriers to intimacy. That's like what the rest of the Bible is all about. As I wrote this message, I looked at a ton of these letters called epistles, and I noted this biblical process, this seven-step process that's in all of them. Paul confronts churches and young pastors with this process that I'm about to rock it through with you. And then Jesus, through John in the book of Revelation, actually confronts seven different churches with this seven-step process I want to share with you. Now, some of you are like, seven points? John, we're 17 minutes into this message. What are we going to do here with seven points? I promise, I'll rock it through them. But uh, let's look at seven steps to removing barriers to relational intimacy. The first step is really simple. you got to make real judgments. I think most Christians are like, I can't judge anyone, because you're misquoting Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, which says, don't judge lest ye be judged. This is talking about a totally different context. The truth is Christians are called to make judgments about right and wrong all the time. Christians are actually called to judge the behavior of other Christians. Did you know that? This is a calling of God on our life. The trick is helping people see their failures without denigrating their worth as humans made in the image of God. That's the real challenge. But there is no problem with making a real judgment about a relationship that is struggling. The bottom line is you actually have to see that there is a problem. I think so many of us have these silent, tension-filled, volatile, unpredictable, explosive relationships. And we think, well, it's just normal. And it's not. I mean, take a moment to remember when you were first dating, when you first fell in love, when you were first friends with your best friend. Take a moment to remember some of those times where you had these uninhibited interactions. That's what a relationship feels like without a yard full of landmines in it. It can feel that way, and it can be that way again. Kristen and I, not always, but for almost all of our marriage, have interacted like newlyweds. Like, we feel like newlyweds. We interact with each other really well, not because we're great together, but because we've made real judgments about issues in our relationship, and we're committed to dealing with those piles so that we can have uninhibited interaction with each other. The second step is you need to think about the outcome that you want to achieve. And this is such a big deal. So many of us have these relational issues, and we think, well, it is what it is. That's just what it's going to be. We're just going to have these problems. So many of us grew up with relational issues in our parents' relationships, in our sibling relationships. It's just what we saw. But it doesn't have to always be like this. A friend of mine has a sister who's like 15. And during this quarantine, it's, it's just become really apparent that this girl has some, some issues, you know, some uh, attitude issues and negativity and self-centeredness and whatever. And um, this girl looked at me, and she's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And I said, no, no. I mean, can't you imagine a life where it wasn't that way, where she was able to see beyond her own needs? I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Can't you just visualize it? Have you thought of an outcome where she was genuinely different? I just want to challenge you today to imagine relationships in your life where things were better. I mean, imagine your husband texting you every time he left work. Imagine coming home and your wife having done some work at the house and made some progress while you were gone. Imagine a life where your husband actually helped you with the dishes and expressed gratitude for your work and making a meal. Imagine a life where she put down her phone after the kids were in bed and talked with you and you were able to share intimacy together regularly. So many of us have relational yards that we don't want, but we don't actually take the time to visualize what we do want. We just are like, yep, I'm unhappy. 
Don't like it. Well, think about what you would like. Think about what would be nice. Think about what it could be like if the garbage was removed. Step number three, once you've done that, make a plan to get there. Sometimes I need to write it out. So many people stop on step two. They're like, yep, well, I really don't like it. It would be nice to be rid of this. But we don't actually imagine how, it would, how we could actually do it, actually visualize a conversation. I remember um, once I had some resentment towards a coworker who worked for me. And I felt like he just wasn't working long enough. But I didn't know for sure. I just lived with his little resentment. Well, finally, I actually made a plan. I watched him come and go for a week, and I noted his hours when he came and when he left, and then I confronted him, and he actually took it super well, and that was the end of the problem forever. Like, it was awesome. And what blew my mind is I made a judgment, and I thought about an outcome, but for a long time, I never actually went through the process of making a plan to address the problem. Whose fault was that? Mine. It's my fault. Months of resentment didn't make him more miserable. It just made me miserable, and I carried this. But once I made a plan, I was free to address the problem. I wish that I'd taken care of it much sooner. Once you identify the issue, once you imagine a future, you need to make a plan. The fourth thing, role play in your mind. Would this work on me? What about on them? I love this passage in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you, Jesus says. This is the essence of the whole Bible. Jesus says, summary of the whole Bible. Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? It's a golden rule. Pretty cool. This is so critical. So often when you make a plan to address an issue in your life, think about, hey, could I receive this without getting upset? What I like to do is if I want to confront somebody about, you know, a relational landmine that exists between us, a lot of times I imagine what I'm going to say. Sometimes I'll even write it out. And then I like to imagine my wife, Kristen, saying it to me. And, you know, there's nobody on earth that I love more than Kristen. There's also nobody on earth that can make me angrier than Kristen can in like a heartbeat, right? And part of it is because I've given so much of my heart to her, she just can cut deeper than anyone else. So anyway, if I imagine me saying, or what I was going to say to someone else, I imagine her saying it to me. A lot of times it makes my pulse beat really fast. And then I sit down and think, okay, why would I expect someone else to be able to receive what I myself can't receive? So then I spend time modifying what I'm going to say and I massage it into something that I think I could receive. And then I go to the person. This is also another place where I might bring in a wise third party for advice. I don't gossip to people. I don't go to friends who are just going to tell me what I want to hear. You know, all your friends, they'll just say, well, you should break up with him, girl. You should leave him, man. And listen, walking away is the easy thing to do. And yeah, sometimes it's justified. I'm not saying, you know, whatever. I'm not saying you can't ever do that. I just think in our world, we end relationships too quickly, right? We just break off friendships of something. We just leave. That's the easy way out. What I like to do is I go to someone that I respect, that is farther along than I am, that I know isn't just going to tell me what I want to hear right? And I ask them for advice. Step number five, after you role played in your mind, would this work on me? Determine if they're swine. And I know that that sounds really harsh, but Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 6, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw away your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and then they will turn and attack you. This sounds really harsh, but basically it's saying, listen, if somebody's pig headed about something, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, I remember several times in my life where I've been pig headed. All of us have been, but specifically for me, there was a girl that I was dating that everybody was like, John, don't do it, okay? Don't do it. You guys are terrible together. Don't date her. It's going to be awful. And I was like, I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to do it, right? And uh, there are some people in your lives who are just determined to do things regardless of what you say or do. It's called being pig-headed. And in that situation, you can give it to college try, but once you realize they're not going to change, it's time to step back. You let them know, hey, your actions hurt me, but irregardless, I'm going to pray for you and love you. If it's someone that you're called to, especially a spouse, parent, or child, Say, I'm going to love you and serve you. I'm not going to enable you. I'm not going to be a codependent. But if I can't change you, it's my time to step back because I can't nag you into something. I always try to remind myself that while their sin might hurt me, sin hurts them most of all. And this is such a critical thing to remember because when I remember that, then I gain compassion for them, understanding that, well, I might be hurting bad. They're hurting more than I am. So I need to have compassion and love for them, praying that they'll continue to change and maybe be more open in the future. Also, (laughs) A lot of times people are like, well, everybody in my life is pig-headed. Nobody listens to me. I, a lot of times <laughs> I have found in my life that um, the hardest pig-headed person to spot is myself. And, and, and a lot of times in my life there have been some periods of time where I'm like, everybody's out to get me. I'm always so hurt. Everybody just hurts me all the time. I feel like everybody, you know, everybody I date, everybody, all my friends, they all let me down and nobody's there for me. Listen. You are the common denominator in all of your hurt relationships. And either, and I tell myself this, John, either there's a massive conspiracy theory or a conspiracy in the whole world. Everybody wakes up and thinks, how can we make John Hill's life miserable? Or, or maybe perhaps the issue is something that I am bringing intrinsically to all my relationships. 
If you in your life, you're like, my adult daughters just don't care about me, and they're just all pig-headed, and they never listen to me, and everybody I interact, and my husband, and my children, and my grandchildren, and everybody betrays me, I just encourage you to sit down, stop for a minute, and look in the mirror and say, hey, you know what? The common denominator in all my relationships is me. And for a lot of us, this point right here is, is not about determining if they are swine, but it's determining if maybe we have some pig-headed issues in our lives. And I've noticed most of the time, the issue isn't with others. The issue is with me. Point number six, um, make sure that it's the right place in time. I know this sounds pretty obvious, but you got to make sure it's the right place in time. In John chapter 8, when Jesus confronts this lady, he says, go and sin no more. He waits until all the other people that were condemning her are gone. And he does it privately. It's the right place in time. I frequently, frequently fail at this. I hurt people. Before all this um, social quarantine stuff started, Kristen and I frequently had staff members or the whole staff over for dinner. And I remember one night in particular, she made cookies. She always makes a lavish meal. She's a great cook, great baker. And uh, she made this lavish meal, but then she made these cookies called monster cookies. And I hate monster cookies because they have peanut butter in them. And to me, peanut butter tastes like a dumpster fire. I hate peanut butter. It's awful. Okay? Some of you might be like, how can you say that? I don't know. I just hate it. I hate the way it tastes. And Kristen knows this. So listen, I said it kindly to her. I thought of an outcome that I wanted, which was monster cookies never appear in the world again. Um, but I just said it in the wrong place in front of the whole staff. I was like, babe, Chris, come here. See these cookies? I'm sure other people think they taste good, but they're terrible. Please never make them again. Didn't go over well. Didn't go over well, right? A lot of apologizing, a lot of making up, a lot of groveling, whatever. Don't do it. Okay, point number seven, affirm the relationship first, then confront the behavior. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4, Paul says, I always thank God, my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Every single letter that Paul writes to every single church, it begins with affirming the relationship before the confrontation comes. All the epistles to the churches, but especially the letters to the church in Corinth, all of them, there are these huge confrontations about issues that they have. And at the start, before anything happens, Paul says, hey, I love you guys. I care about you. I'm glad that you're here. Basically, every book in the New Testament after Acts includes something like this. They all go through this process that I just laid out for you. I mean, this is like the structure of the letters in the Bible. They start off with seeing issues, visualizing an outcome, making a plan, praying through and thinking like, am I saying this in the right way? They think about whether or not the target, you know, is swine. They find the right time and place, and they love and affirm the relationship at the very beginning. Listen, if you're having a hard conversation, and the person you're talking to is not assured of your unyielding compassion for them, I'm telling you, it's probably not going to go well. Recently, a friend of mine had uh, to come to me for some advice about a hard conversation. He had just caught his wife in some infidelity. She didn't know it yet. He was very upset and very hurt. And uh, he said, how should I confront this? And I said, first of all, if you're able to forgive her, which he was, I said, you cannot come at her angry in the conversation. You need to come at her with love and compassion. You need to assure her of your unyielding faithfulness. Because if you do, and you humble yourself in that way, it is far more likely that she will confess and repent. If you get angry, she's probably not going to be able to receive it. you got to assure at the very start of the conversation, hey, I'm going I'm to say something hard. I've got something I want, but I want you to know that I love you no matter what, and that I'm not leaving you, and that we're in this together. I believe that if you apply this process to your life, it'll serve you really well. It worked great for Paul. It worked for Jesus, and it's definitely served me quite well. <clears throat> As we close, I want to share one story with you. And uh, this is a story I've shared parts of before, but my dad has always thought that he's terrible at uh, confrontation. And uh, I actually don't think that's true. I can remember several times where my mother and father have confronted me and changed my life. In college, uh, I only ever dated one serious girl in my life besides Kristen. Lots of dates, but only one serious girlfriend before Kristen. And I knew my family felt like this particular girl was not a good fit. We had dated for several years. And for the first couple years, I just was pig-headed. It was pearls before swine. I didn't want to hear. Everybody told me don't, and I was like, I don't care what you say. So my dad prayed and waited. I don't know how he determined it was time, but I was home for Christmas. I think it was Christmas 2009, and my dad actually initiated a conversation with me, and he took me out to Dunn Brothers Coffee, which is kind of a big deal. Monomedia, Minnesota. My dad hated coffee. He was in the apex of his career. He was a super busy man, but he initiated going to Dunn Brothers Coffee with me, and I felt honored. And after some small talk, my dad took a moment he just said, John, I know you love this girl. I know you care about her. And I love and respect who you are as a son and as a man. And ultimately, John, I want to emphasize you have the freedom to do whatever you want. But I wanted to point out some things about your relationship with her that I've observed. I think that you guys are not bringing out the best in each other. And I think more significantly, your goals of ministry don't seem to be compatible with her future desires for life. I think most heartbreakingly, I remember my dad said, 
I don't see you following Jesus with the same zeal and passion that you once were. And whether this is because of her, because of you, I don't know. But your mother and I humbly wanted to ask you to visualize what a marriage to her would look like 30 years from now based on the current trajectory of your relationship. Not based on your feelings, not based on what you hope, but based on the current trajectory of your relationship. I want you to visualize a life 20, 30, and 40 years from now. He ended with, no matter what, we love you. We respect that your decisions are yours to make. But as you, consider, as you consider serious, lifelong choices, we wanted to share these thoughts with you. It was a conversation I'll never forget. I remember my heart racing, beating out of my chest. I had remembered before that wondering why my mother and father had become more distant. And I was thankful that my dad had the courage, authenticity, and discipline to share this with me. In the end, the conversation saved me from a difficult and highly incompatible marriage. It wasn't instant. I dated that girl for another six months. But I went from ring shopping that Christmas to evaluating and visualizing. Mom and dad probably thought that they had failed in that conversation. But it was a success on so many different levels. I think more significantly for this message, it removed some landmines that existed in my relationship with my mother and father. And that's part of why we've always had a really close relationship with each other. It's because my parents have just set this example of refusing to allow relational landmines to exist in the yard of our love for one another. It's always been a place that I've been safe to go because we've worked so hard to keep that area clean, to keep that space safe. I'm thankful for their example in my life, and I'm thankful for Christ setting the example for all of us. Right now in all of our respective locations, I believe that God is bringing to mind a number of different relational yards that have some landmines in them. I believe that as I wrote this message, I was just praying that God would restore some relationships between fathers and daughters and mothers and sons and husbands and wives. I prayed that God would do a great work during this time of social distancing where our core families would experience a deeper, richer intimacy with one another. I've been praying that God would bring healing to places that have been hurting. I want you to know I think there's some of you here today who are realizing there's broken intimacy and there's stunted connection. It doesn't have to be this way. Cleaning the mess is not fun, but having a clean, stress-free yard to love one another in is so worth it. I just want to challenge you to consider doing that this week. I wrote down some questions at the end of this message that I thought would be helpful. And uh, the first question I wrote down is, what does the yard of your relationship with God look like? The most important relationship in our life is our relationship with God. I think our relationship with God paves the way to intimacy with everybody else. I think part of the reason Christians have the highest level of relational fulfillment on earth, of any subgroup of people on earth, is specifically because of our relationship with God. And I think there are some of you here who are realizing right now, there's a lot of landmines in that yard. Whether it's neglect, doubt, idols, you know, prioritizing other things above God, or in some cases, just downright sin. I want to challenge you to deal with it. I want to challenge you to repent. I want to challenge you to come to him. I can think of no other relationship that is more important than our relationship with God. And today, I would just challenge some of you to say, you know what, I want to seek reconciliation. I want to remove those barriers. I want to be able to interact with God again. I felt like I couldn't be near to him for so long or maybe ever. What if today you said, you know what, I really want to deal with those things we got this number up here, 474747. If you text I'm in, no spaces, just I'm in to that number, we'll um, send you just a, a quick questionnaire to help us understand how to help you best. Take like two seconds to respond to. And then I would love for my wife, Kristen, or our executive director, Elise, to give you a call this week. We want to help you fix that relationship with God. We want to help you take that next step. We want to help remove barriers that exist between you and God so that you can love him more fully and more completely or at all. My second question is really simple. I want you to describe the yard of your closest relationships. Are you stressed about stepping in landmines? My hope and prayer is that maybe some teenage daughters or teenage sons would go to their parents and say, hey, I've noticed that our interaction isn't what it once was, and I'm not sure what the barriers are, but I wanted to have an open conversation of what we can do to love one another better. I'd love to see our relationship Restored. I want to have an authentic conversation. I pray that maybe a husband could go to a wife and say, hey, I'm sorry, I've been shutting down. I felt awkward in this area. And I just, I want to start a systematic process of beginning to address some of the deeper issues within our life. Because I want to remove these barriers to intimacy so that we can love one another the way that we first did, the way that God calls us to. And lastly, 
What is one serious conversation you can commit to having this week? And some of you, ladies especially, I don't want you to make a whole laundry list. Don't overwhelm your family with like, here are 50 different things that we need to confront this week. No, 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 one, one. We're going for one this week. One, one conversation. I believe that if you could begin to practice a discipline of removing these barriers to intimacy in your life, you're gonna experience a new level of intimacy. You're gonna experience a new level of blessing. It'll be really great. I wanna pray and then I'm gonna turn it over to the ladies. I'd ask you to bow your heads and pray with me in all of your respective locations. Jesus, I pray for the relationships of the people of this church. God, I pray that through this message, you would bring healing, that you would remove barriers to intimacy, that you would restore broken relationships. Most importantly, God, I pray that you would remove barriers to intimacy with you. I pray that we could see a whole generation of people loving you without inhibitions, completely, totally, with their whole hearts. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, that you make it possible to remove everything that stands between us and you. You are a good God. We love you and thank you for all that you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said amen and amen. Well, I'm excited about the discussion the ladies have for you in the lobby. We have some exciting announcements this week before I turn it over to them because we're part of one family. Even if it's your first time tuning in, we like to end with a team on three. Um, so uh, let's end with a team on three. Hands in, hands in, everybody. One, two, three, team.